Chapter 1. The Not-So-Secret Torment of P. Wee Morris P. Wee Morris had never been to Porky's, unless you counted his dreams. In his dreams, P. Wee went there all the time. Tonight, he was a fashion photographer, and Porky's was his exclusive studio. He was under a big contract with Sears, Roebuck, to take pictures for the bra and panty advertisements in the upcoming Christmas catalogs. He'd been chosen over all the other professional photographers because he had such a way with the ladies, and the ladies that were lined up for tonight's shooting were nothing short of sensational. Marilyn Monroe, Jane Mansfield, Rosalind Russell, Elizabeth Taylor, Audrey Hepburn, and, of course, Wendy Williams, the sex symbol of Angel Beach High. While he was setting up his equipment, he could hear them laughing and giggling back and forth. They were talking about him, and he could pick up a few key words in their conversation. Big. Animal. Wears me out. Can't get enough, stud. He tried not to let it go to his head. After all, he knew they were talking loud enough for him to overhear, and they were all trying to outdo one another with the flattery, knowing that he would choose only one of them to accompany him to his private chambers after the shooting. When he was ready, he took up his position behind the camera and snapped his fingers. One by one, the women came out, wearing their dainty bras and tight-fitting panties, posing in front of his camera, turning this way and that, all the time smiling provocatively at him. I miss you, Pee-wee, Marilyn purred. Rosalind suddenly mentioned that she just had a visit from an Oriental merchant who'd given her a strange and wonderful aphrodisiac that she was just dying to try out. He played along with all their flirtations while he snapped picture after picture, taking good care of the business end of things. Finally, he was down to Wendy, who came out wearing a negligee of black lace. As she took her position before the camera and wildly shook her hair from side to side, she blew him kisses and thanked him repeatedly for the wonderful time he'd shown her the night before. She never had it so good, she said. She was still sore and aching from the lovemaking, and she couldn't wait to feel it all over again. He chuckled lightly and promised that he'd get around to her again soon enough. She said she couldn't wait for the others to have their turn. She had to have him now. The others overheard her pleadings and quickly rushed out of the dressing room. Instead of bras and panties, they now had strips of black cardboard held across their breasts and loins, like the women pictured in the magazines Pee Wee kept hidden in his grandmother's attic. It's me you want, Pee Wee, Elizabeth whispered, swaying the black bar tantalizingly before her. No, me. 
Audrey countered impassionately. Marilyn pursed her lips and reminded Peewee of that night in Rio. Finally, Wendy held her hands up and asked all the other beauties to be quiet a minute so she could suggest something. They drew into a huddle, and when they were finished, they all lined up behind Wendy, who'd somehow managed to slip out of her negligee and now stood naked and half hidden behind a large black cape that she held in front of her like a matador. You can have all of us, she teased Pee-wee, shaking the cape slightly. All you have to do is come and get us. He smirked knowingly at this and stepped away from his camera. As he slowly undressed, the others leaned to one side or the other of Wendy and beckoned to him in soft, sultry whispers. Take me, Pee-wee. Yes, Pee-wee, I want you inside me. Fuck me, Pee-wee. Do what you will with me, Pee-wee. He laughed lightly at their pleadings. Then, once he was naked, he put his hands to his head and pointed out two fingers like horns. Leaning forward, he playfully charged them. All of a sudden, things started going wrong. Wendy's cape turned into an open door and Pee-wee ran through it finding himself in darkness outside as the door closed behind him. He could hear them all laughing at him, laughing so hard they were almost crying. Enraged, he threw himself against the door, beating on it with his fists, but to no avail. When his hands became too sore for him to go on, he stepped back and almost tripped over a fat, waddling pig that had strayed up to him. He looked down at the pig, and it turned its snout face up at him and oinked. What's the matter, Pee-wee? Can't even get any when you're dreaming? Pee-wee awoke to the rapping of his mother's knuckles on his bedroom door. Edward, it's past nine o'clock. Are you going to sleep through the whole weekend? Pee-wee groaned and slowly opened his eyes. He had a throbbing erection. Sunlight was slanting through the shades and falling across his bed. He rolled over on his side to avoid the bright glare and tried to will himself back to sleep in hopes of having a second chance with the lovelies at the porgies of his dreams. Mrs. Morris let herself in, smiling cheerfully as she opened the shades and flooded the room with light. Come along now, Edward. It's a beautiful day. She turned on the small desk radio by his bed, and the disc jockey joined her in haranguing Pee-wee to join the world of the living before turning the airways over to Patty Page's latest hit record. When Pee-wee continued to curl under the covers to hide his erection, Mrs. Morris frowned with concern. Edward, is something wrong? No, Ma, Pee-wee grimaced. I, uh, just pull a little muscle in my groin. That's all. It's nothing. Well, be careful for heaven's sake. She drifted back to the doorway, then called out over her shoulder. I'll have your breakfast ready in five minutes. Don't let it get cold, understand? I'll be there, Ma. As soon as she closed the door behind her, Pee-wee leaned over and opened the top drawer of his bedside dresser. Pushing aside old issues of Boy's Life and a few Superman comics, he pulled out a ruler, then sat up in bed and unsnapped the fly of his pajamas to measure himself. Shit, he swore and tossed the ruler aside. Squirming about, he lifted the top corner of his mattress and pulled out a cardboard chart. It was a graph with inches marked off on the vertical column and dates on the horizontal. He stared at the jagged line that stretched across the chart as the grim realization settled in. Jesus, it is! It's getting shorter! Shit! He marked off the latest entry, shaking his head with misery. Although he stood only five foot four in his stocking feet, and his father was an avid fan of Brooklyn Dodger shortstop, Pee Wee Reese. 
Neither of these factors was responsible for the nickname that had been hung upon Pee Wee Morris. He'd been rechristened during his first trip to the showers after gym practice at West Beach Junior High. From the downward curve of his growth chart, it looked like Pee Wee might never live down his name. And it wasn't only the size of Pee Wee's penis that had him worried. There was also the matter of its performance, or lack of the same. Last night, Pee Wee had blown the best chance in his life to get laid. This morning, he was ready to leave the country. Better that than face the ridicule he'd get from the other guys once they'd heard about his fiasco with Wendy Williams. It was bad enough that they all knew his glands kept him in a constant state of unfulfilled lust. Virginity was Pee Wee's accursed affliction, and at times his horniness was more than he could bear. At the rate he was going, he knew all too well the way he'd end up being depicted in a high school yearbook with his face superimposed over the head of a dog humping a hydrant. Pee Wee Morris, horniest senior at West Beach High, most likely to die a virgin. It was a long swim to Cuba, though, so leaving the country was out of the question. The best Pee Wee could do was wolf down his breakfast and have his mother drive him down to the bus stop so he could ride across the county line to visit his grandmother. With a hundred miles of Everglades between him and his friends, he could at least have a couple of days' peace before facing up to the inevitable humiliation. Besides, he had a secret stash of magazines waiting there to provide him with much-needed consolation in these his darkest hours. Pee-wee spent Saturday helping his grandmother plant fall bulbs in her garden. At supper time, she heaped his plate high with spaghetti while they listened to opera music on the big zenith in the dining room. After Grandma fell asleep listening to her Mario Lanza records, Pee-wee huddled in the back corner of the attic amidst the heady vapors of mothballs and mildew and feasted on the exotic offerings of Playtime magazine, envisioning the wondrous treasures that lay behind the black bars the women wore for underwear. When he tired of that, there were the Sears catalogs and their full-page spreads for bras and panties. The pictures were clear enough for Pee-wee to trace on paper and fill in massive breasts and throbbing nests of pubic hair where lace and cotton had been before. Art was Pee-wee's best subject at school. Pee-wee had taken the bus to his grandmother's because his 52 Crosley was in the shop. On Sunday, his mother made the trip out to visit, and that evening they rode home together. It was a clear night, only a silver shy of a full moon, but as they made their way through the jungle density of the Everglades, the canopy of mangroves choked out most of the light and made the way before them dark and dreamlike as it swirled with faint wisps of fog. As they approached the Seward County line, Pee Wee leaned close to the window, almost pressing his face against the glass for a better view of the surrounding swampland. He was straining his eyes for a glimpse of something special and at last he saw the glimmer of blinking neon that was so out of place in this primeval hinterland. And I must have taken a half dozen calls from your friends asking where you were. Pee-wee's mother was droning behind the wheel. When he didn't respond, she glanced over at him and asked, Edward, are you listening? Pee-wee nodded distractedly and squinted his eyes for a better look at the distant glow. Finally, they passed a slight clearing, and he could make out the neon outlines of two cartoon pigs standing on their hind legs and wearing clothes. But these were not pigs of the Disney variety. When the lights blinked on and off, the male pig did a short jig for joy, and the female pig winked as she bent forward and raised her skirt to reveal pulsing pink buttocks and the electric curlicue of her tail. 
Oh, wow, Pee Wee moaned, lowering the window so he wouldn't fog it. His britches were bulging. What's that? Mrs. Morris asked, slowing the car down. Is something wrong? Uh, I think I saw something by the side of the road back a ways, Ma, Pee Wee said, leaning his head back for another glimpse at the retreating vision in the swamp. Why don't you stop while I go back and check? Mrs. Morris gently goaded the accelerator, and the car swept forward. I'll do no such thing, she said primly. You don't know the kind of things that go on in these parts, Edward. It's bad enough we have to drive through here at night. Stopping is most definitely out of the question. Now close the window and make sure your door is locked. Ah, oh, Ma, do as I say, young man, she said, driving on. Before he rolled up the window, Pee-wee stuck his head out and took one last longing glance backward. The neon pigs were now blocked from view, but he could make out another part of the sign. Letters, pulsating with the color of hot flesh, blinked out a word that was mythic throughout all of southern Florida. Porkies. Edward, yeah, ma. Pee-wee slowly rolled up the window, drowning out the croaks, whoops, and other foreboding sounds of the swamp. Porkies, he thought to himself over and over. Porkies, porkies, porkies. The forbidden land filled with forbidden fruit. When would he have his chance to go there and claim his share? When? When? As I was saying, Edward, your friends kept calling all weekend. You didn't tell me you were supposed to be helping to work on the class float for homecoming. Gee, Ma, I forgot all about it, Pee-wee said, crossing both his fingers and his legs. Just the thought of Porky's got him to thinking about his secret pleasures in the attic, and his erection was trying to punch its way out of his pants, like Rocky Marciano boxing his way out of a refrigerator crate. Anyway, he mumbled, there's plenty of kids to help on the float. Grandma's only got me to help her. I suppose that's true, Edward. It's very thoughtful of you. You know how much she likes having you over. Yeah. Good deeds like that don't go unrewarded, you know, Edward. Mrs. Morris said as they crossed the county line. Some day you'll be repaid for all your consideration. When? Pee Wee wondered, still thinking about Porky's. When? Repay me now. Turn this car around and take me to Porky's. They'll repay me, but good. But they left the Everglades behind, and within the hour they were back in the slumbering suburbs of Angel Beach. Street lights shone on neat homes, tidy lawns, and the huge, shining American cars parked in asphalt driveways. It was quiet and peaceful. It was 1955. Chapter 2 A Schemes Afoot at Angel Beach High If Pee Wee Morris was going to make the high school yearbook as horny a senior or most likely to die a virgin, Billy McCarty and Tommy Turner were running neck and neck in the battle for class clown. They even looked a little alike, with their short dark hair, tall frames, and easy smiles. Billy was the lankier of the two and had a thicker southern drawl. Tommy spent more money on clothes and liked to wear his hair slightly uncombed, the James Dean look. The easiest way to tell them apart, though, was to catch them pulling into the school parking lot. Tommy drove a 50 four-door Chevy that ran like a clock, while Billy's Ford Coupe was a few years older and sped black smoke from its rusting tailpipe. Monday morning, they eased into their parking spots at roughly the same time, and they both had the same thing on their minds. Hey, Tommy, Billy called out, slamming his door. You get the color guy? Does a fat dog fart? Tommy grinned, falling in beside his friend as they crossed the parking lot, books in hand. They were early for school, as was half the student body. It was a gorgeous day. The sun beamed down from a cloudless sky and a light breeze stirred the palm fronds surrounding the brick school, 
built upon the site of the previous Angel Beach High, which had been flattened during the Great Hurricane of 1926. What's he look like? Billy asked. Oh man, like a friggin' Zulu warrior, Tommy boasted. He's six four and he's got two, count them, two gold teeth right in front. Oh shit! Billy couldn't believe it. That was supposed to be the biggest snag in their plan. Where'd you find him? At Renafug, where else? Tommy laughed. Har har, come on, where? He works for my old man's construction company. I can't vouch for his brains, but he looks like he could kill, and he only costs ten bucks. Ten bucks? Not bad. What about your end? Tommy asked. You got the broad lined up for sure? Billy grinned. He was about to reply when he glanced over Tommy's shoulder. Uh-oh, he whispered, elbowing Tommy. Looks like we got trouble. Marvin Brode, the parking lot monitor, was making his way across the parking lot like somebody who'd spent one too many matinees watching Gary Cooper in High Noon. He had close-cropped hair and owlish glasses, and was the only guy at Angel Beach High who wore a tie and kept the waistline of his pants pulled up above his hips. Yo, high pockets, Tommy called out amiably as he yanked his Levi's up so that his belt buckle was even with his navel and his cuffs were high above his ankles. Billy did the same, then smiled at Marvin. How they hang in high pockets? Marvin ignored the jibe and stopped in front of them. He looked seriously at Tommy. You did a little spin out when you drove in, Turner. That's against regulations. New tires, Marv, Tommy said. They're a little overzealous. Give them time and I'm sure they'll learn I'm going to have to cite you for a demerit, Marvin replied. Oh my God, no, Tommy gasped, dropping to his knees. He looked up with pleading eyes at Marvin. Marvin, please, show a little kindness. I've got a wife, two kids. Knock it off, Turner. Nobody's laughing. Billy stopped laughing. Hey, Marvin, you really dress nice and all, but I was wondering, just what do you do with your nuts when you wear your pants so high? I mean, doesn't it get to be a little crowded? I leave them at home in a drawer, Marvin answered without missing a beat. I only wear them on dates. Tommy and Billy looked at each other, amazed. Marvin was hard-pressed to keep from smiling. Why, Marvin, what's come over you? Tommy asked. I thought you'd taken shots so you wouldn't catch a sense of humor. Marvin crossed his arms and regarded both Tommy and Billy with equal disdain. Listen, I know you guys think I'm a square and a jerk, but let me tell you something. Ten years from now, when I'm running my own corporation or law office... You two and all the other clowns you hang out with will be hanging your beer bellies over some pool table in a run-down bar and wondering how you managed to piss your lives away on cheap thrills. Then we'll see who laughs. Without waiting for them to respond, Marvin dropped his arms to his side and strolled away to confront another student who'd parked his car in two spaces. What do you know, Billy said. Old High Pocket's got some balls after all. Yeah. Tommy muttered. He keeps them home in a drawer. There was a loud sound of screeching tires and the roar of a tampered engine as a black pickup with a white streak down its center barreled into the parking lot. Guess who? Billy said fastuously as they watched. The pickup speed across the lot, sending students running to get out of its way. The truck suddenly braked to a halt then, just as quickly, jolted forward again tires spinning so fast that gravel sprayed out behind it. The other students waved their fists and shouted curses at the driver. Jarvis, you stupid redneck, Tommy yelled. The pickup slipped into a parking spot and a blonde-haired teenager hopped out of the cab, beaming at his grand entrance and walking with a rolling swagger. Mickey Jarvis's family had roots in the Mississippi River Delta that went back as far as the Louisiana Purchase, and his grandparents had been among the first settlers of Angel Beach when it was little more than a trading post and poacher's paradise known as Gator Cove. Hey, hey, he yipped at his critics. When I'm at the wheel, you better take hill. What can I say? I think you've said enough, Marvin sneered, catching up with Mickey. Try that one more time, Jarvis, and it'll be the end of your parking privileges. 
Mickey raised his middle finger and waved it in Marvin's face. How about taking a twirl on this brown nose? Two demerits, Jarvis. Mickey flipped his other bird. I got two for you, too, jerk. Now give me a little air, eh? He walked away from Marvin and fell in between Tommy and Billy, asking, Did you get the nigger? You mean the colored guy, Billy corrected, only half kidding. The knee grew. You're nothing but poor white trash, Jarvis, Tommy added. You know that? Grinning proudly, Mickey draped his arms around Tommy and Billy's shoulders. Yeah? Well, fuck you and the horse you rode in on. Fuck you and the horse you rode in on, Tommy repeated, as if he didn't understand the meaning. That's colorful redneck humor, right? Right, and kiss my rebel ass. That's another one, Tommy said with mock amazement. Billy said, you should be writing these down, Tommy. Mickey pulled his arms back and spat in the dirt. <laughs> you both can go back up north and rub asses with all the Negroes you want. This is Dixie, man. Billy and Tommy looked at each other and shook their heads slowly. But Mickey wasn't paying attention to them. He was flashing his lady killer smile at Beth Ann Robarts, the class valedictorian, who had the looks of a beauty queen and the reputation of the ice woman who wouldn't come it. Beth Ann took one look at Mickey and veered away from him. Marvin happily moved in and offered to carry her books. Hey, Jarvis, Tommy asked. How come you don't have four first names like most hillbillies? You know, like Billy Joe Jim Bob or Flora Mae Sally Sue. A serious look spread across Mickey's face. I had a cousin named Billy Joe Jim Bob. He died in the war. So watch what you're saying, hear? Both Tommy and Billy laughed as they started up the walk leading to school. There was a banner stretched out across the front entrance, reminding students of the pep rally scheduled after classes that afternoon. Friday was the big game with Green Acre City. Anyway, did you get a Negro? Mickey said. Yeah, we got one, Tommy said. Guy's six four, gold teeth, Billy boasted, still trying to picture the man himself. Meanest looking mother you ever saw. Mickey rubbed his hands together with expectation. Oh, man, oh, man, those guys are going to croak when they see this guy coming after them. Who all's going, anyway? Before Tommy could answer, someone shouted his name. It was Wendy Williams. She rushed over, curls wantonly bounding around her head. She was slim and pretty, and her large, dark eyes looked like they'd seen more than any girl her age should have. There was more than a fair share of brain behind her body, which kept her reputation out of the gutter, despite her widely advertised promiscuity. The guys greeted her as one of the gang. Did you get it? She asked Tommy. Not yet, but I found a place that's got one, Tommy told her. I'll go tomorrow. Don't let me down, Wendy said. I'm going to get that little jerk. As she walked off to join a few of the other girls, Mickey looked at Tommy. What's going on? Who's she going to get? Pee-wee, didn't you hear about the other night? No, what happened? Well, we figured we had to get Pee-wee laid, so I fixed him up with Wendy. Pee-wee and Wendy? Mickey wondered aloud. I thought she had better taste. Billy took over, saying, There she was, easy pickings. Pee-wee's dream come true. They were making out, and you know Wendy. She reaches down and unzips his fly and grabs his cock. And guess what? What? The little bastard already had a rubber on. Oh, bullshit, Mickey howled, doubling over. I swear, Billy testified. Wendy told me herself. Why would she lie? That horny little mother wore a rubber to his date. Tommy said she got so pissed off she wouldn't let him touch her. Mickey had to stop walking until his laughter subsided. Tears were almost pouring down his face as he imagined the look on Wendy's face when she first saw Pee-wee's surprise. What's she going to do to him? Just wait, Tommy said. You'll find out. As if he'd heard his cue, Pee-wee came hurrying down the sidewalk to catch up with the others, shouting, Hey, wait up! Well, if it isn't ready, Eddie, Mickey said. Hey, man, off my case, Pee-wee said, catching his breath. I got nothing to say about that. Let's talk about tonight. He looked up at Tommy. 
I'm going tonight, right? I don't know, Pee-wee, Tommy said. Even the nymphomaniacs got standards. Come on, you guys. Mickey leered. She lives with a big black negro, Pee-wee. If he catches you, he'll cut your pecker off. Yeah, Billy warned. He's probably got a pair of tweezers just for the occasion. Pee-wee waved away their teasing and bragged. I don't care if she lives with a pope and a blue-ass baboon. She likes to screw, right? Loves it, man, Tommy said, sneaking a wink at Billy. Can't get enough, especially young guys. The more, the merrier. Pee-wee's eyes lit up. This couldn't be true. All these years of waiting for the right chance, and he was going to rebound from his failure with Wendy and end up getting laid with a woman of the world. Oh, thank you, Grandma, he thought excitedly. Pay me back with interest. What's she look like? he asked Billy. Huh? Is she good looking or what? Billy shrugged nonchalantly. Not bad. Great body, though. Moves like an eel. That's the way I like him. That's the way I like him. Mickey chortled. Pee-wee, you'd like him anyway, as long as they're not dead. Pee-wee looked up at Mickey innocently. I don't care if they're dead, as long as they're not too cold. Sick, Billy moaned, making a face. The boy's sick. As they strayed from the sidewalk to mill around in the front schoolyard, Pee-wee said, Hey, look, let's not bring too many guys. That way we can all get her twice. Listen to this midget, Mickey drawled. He's not even invited and he's making out the guest list. A flash of panic came over Pee-wee's face and his voice rose slightly. Listen, I'm going, he whined. You bastards, you're not cutting me out of any free nookie. The three others looked to one another as if they were conferring about a crucial decision. Pee-wee stared at them as his heart pounded furiously. He was going tonight. Whether they liked it or not. If he had to, he'd hide in the trunk or hire a taxi to follow them. Anything it took. All right, all right, Tommy finally told Pee-wee. You're going. Now quit your belly aching. All right, Pee-wee pounded a fist in his palm. Eight o'clock, right? Right, Mickey said, as he and the other two started walking off to join the other students. Over his shoulder, he added, Wear your rubber. That lying bitch. Pee-wee seethed, looking over at where Wendy was talking with some of the other girls. Was she telling them about him too, he wondered. What was next? A play-by-play -play announcement over the intercom during homeroom? The front page of the school paper? One of the girls Wendy was talking to suddenly broke away from the others and started walking across the grass. She was heading over to the cyclone fence that separated the front of the school grounds from the athletic fields. A group of jocks were loitering by the fence, and the girls stopped in front of them. Naivete was written all over her face. She batted a pair of long lashes as she stared at the biggest of the youths, Tony Tuparello. Tony was an all-county defensive tackle for the Angel Beach football team, and from the looks of him, he probably kept in shape by wrestling alligators in the swamp. His dark hair was slicked back around his head into a perfect D.A. He chewed idly on a toothpick as he eyed the girl before him, like a cat looking at a bird with broken wings. Hi, the girl cheeped, bouncing lightly up and down on the balls of her feet as she hugged her books in front of her. My name is Mindy. Can I ask you something? Yeah. The big guy said coolly. Sure. Why did he call you meat? The other jocks smirked and looked away, unable to keep straight faces. One of them, Tim Kavanaugh, was palming a cigarette and sneaking quick puffs off it whenever he was sure there weren't any faculty members looking his way. Meat stared calmly at Mindy and shrugged his shoulders. Wendy Williams said I should ask him, Mindy warbled. She did, huh? Meat glanced across the campus and saw Wendy and her friends giggling as they waved to him. They knew how Meat got his nickname. They gave it to him. Why do they call you Meat? Mindy persisted. Is it because you're so big? Kavanaugh finally let out a whoop, dropping his cigarette and slapping Meat on the back. Meat kept his cool. 
Yeah, he told Mindy. Sort of. Not sort of, Mindy said, miffed. <laughs> Why? Meat stood up straight and looked at his cohorts, who were in the process of being reduced to hysterics. He sighed and asked Mindy, You really want to know? Yes, Mindy bubbled, paying no attention to the hyenas. Meat shrugged again and looked around for a private spot on campus. Finding one, he said, Okay, Mindy, come on, I'll show you. Kavanaugh grabbed Meat by the shoulder, held him back, and tried to talk through his laughter. No, Meat, she's only a freshman. Right, Meat winked, but after this, she'll be an instant senior. This set the others off again, and Mindy looked at them with sudden confusion. Oh, what's so funny, she demanded. I don't get it. Well, you're going to soon enough, one of them howled. Kavanaugh kept holding Meat back from the fence. Hey, listen, Meat, if you get suspended again, you'll never get that scholarship to Princeton. That was all Meat had to hear. Looking at Mindy, he shook his head. It's not what you think, he told her with mock sincerity. You see, my old man, he works at a meat packing plant. You know, the one down by the marina? Well, that's all there is to it. Come on, Mindy said, then what's the big deal? I didn't say it was a big deal. The school bell rang and everyone started for the entrance. Mindy whirled around and ran off after Wendy and her friends shouting, Hey, wait for me. I want an explanation. Meat called out to her, That's Pee Wee there on your right. Why don't you ask him how he got his name? Chapter 3 Tommy Turner's Top 10 If you went by his teaching contract and the covers of the textbooks in his class, basketball coach Harlan Goodenough taught fourth period civics too. But since Goodenough barely knew the difference between a referendum and a referee, little time was spent in teaching students the finer points of government and sociology. A better description of his class might have been advanced reminiscence or the fine art of shooting the shit. There was a lot of lung in Coach Goodenough's barrel chest, and most of it was filled with hot air. One hour a day was hardly enough time for him to complete more than a few steps in his constant stroll down memory lane. Today, as on most days, he was sitting on the edge of his desk, reliving his tour of duty in the Pacific during World War II. To hear him tell it, Coach Goodenough's exploits stretched across every major battle in the Pacific, from his near brush with death at Pearl Harbor to his losing in a poker game, the chance to be aboard the Enola Gay when it went to drop the A-bomb on Hiroshima. In today's exciting adventure, Goodenough was among the troops, landing at Iwo Jima in February of 1945 to reclaim the island from the Japanese. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the famous photo that ended up becoming an even more famous statue, the gray-haired coach was saying. He stared out over the heads of his students as if trying to visualize that dim, distant memory. What I bet you don't know is that, in reality, the photo that became famous was the second one taken of the Marines planting a flag in that hard-earned soil. You look surprised. Well, let me assure you it's true, because, you see, I was there when the first picture was taken. As a matter of fact, I was holding the tripod stand for the sergeant who took that first picture. I tell you, we were all muddy and tired and miserable, but just happy as heck with what we'd managed to do for our country. When I looked at these buddies of mine leaning on the flagpole, just trying to get it set firmly in the soil, well, I can't begin to explain how inspired I was. The image of what they'd done stuck with me all day, and when this professional photographer for Life magazine came ashore later, I told him about our experience that morning. Of course, he had to get a shot of the flag raising, and he asked me to help him set it up. Well, I was only more than glad to oblige. I would have put myself in the picture as one of the Marines, but I thought it would make the moment less authentic. Yeah, I bet, Meat whispered under his breath in the back row of the classroom. 
he looked over at Tommy, who was sitting next to him. I got ten bucks as he was sitting on his ass in some kitchen at the base, peeling potatoes or picking his nose. No bet, Tommy mumbled. He was hunched over his desk, scribbling notes on a small scrap of paper. What you doing? Meat asked him. You aren't writing any of this shit down, are you? What do you think? He's going to give us a quiz on it or something? Tommy shook his head. No, man. It's the first Monday of the month. I'm working on the new survey. Oh, right, Meat said, going back to doodling on his notebook. Meat's specialty was tornadoes. If he was feeling ambitious, he'd draw a stick figure of a woman next to the tornado and make it look like the wind was blowing up her skirt, just like what happened to Marilyn Monroe in his favorite scene of his favorite movie of all time, The Seven-Year Itch. It had come out only a few months ago, and he'd already seen it twelve times. Hey, meat, Tommy hissed once Coach Goodenough had gotten his second wind and launched into another anecdote. How'd you rate Beth Ann Robarts for legs? Meat thought about it a moment. I don't know. B plus? B plus? Man, you're crazy. She's an A if anyone is. It's your survey, man. Damn right. She rates an A for legs, no question. You just got Marilyn on the brain when it comes to legs. That's your problem. True, Meat said, doodling another raised skirt next to a tornado on his notebook. Very true. How about tits? How should I know? Meat said. You got eyes, don't you? She's an A there, too, Tommy said, making a mark on his paper. Meat leaned to one side in his chair and looked up toward the front of the class. Beth Ann was attentively listening to Coach Goodenough explain how he taught General MacArthur to use a nine iron while they were both serving in the Philippines. I think you should put an asterisk after that A you're giving her, Meat told Tommy. How come? What for? Because nobody's had a good look at her tits, that's why, Meat said. Maybe they only rate a C and the rest is Kleenex, right? Tommy molded over, then erased the mark he'd made on the sheet and changed it. You're right. I'll just give her a B. A solid B, though. Now, how about access? Is there any question? Meat said. Tommy shook his head. A definite F, he sighed. I'm sorry, Beth Ann, but that's going to hurt your overall score. This year's still young, Meat said hopefully. Hey, Tommy, what's the story about tonight? Tommy looked over and raised a thumb. All systems go. Who's going? You, me, Billy, Mickey, Pee Wee, Kavanaugh, maybe Frank Bell, and that new guy, Brian Schwartz. Pee Wee? What's he going to do? Change the sheets? Halftime show, Tommy cracked. Look, me, I gotta finish this, okay? Right. Tommy looked over his figures, scratching his head. Meat? Still here, Meat yawned back. How about Wendy? What would you rate her for shoes? Shoes? Yeah, shoes. Look, I like to be comprehensive here. Shoes, Meat muttered. She keeps them polished pretty much, don't you think? Hell, how should I know, Tommy? I don't spend that much time looking at a broad's shoes, you know what I mean? All I know is they're the first things off. Well, then you can rate on how fast they get out of them, right? I mean, loafers come off quicker than bucks. That should count for something, don't you think? Meat took a long, hard look at Tommy, then shook his head. <laughs> and they tell me I'm just a dumb jock. The bell rang and finally put an end to Coach Goodenough's monologue. Ah, well, he sighed ruefully, standing up. For tomorrow, be sure to read chapter seven and eight and answer the questions in the back of the book. That will be all. As the class filed out of the room, Marvin drifted over to the coach's desk and said, Excellent talk today, sir. I found it most enlightening. You did, did you? Goodenough said. Oh, absolutely, Marvin gushed. I was wondering, sir. Well, I work on the school paper, as you probably know, and I have this idea that maybe we could run a short series on some of your recollections. 
It would give the parents something to relate to in the paper, and that way they might make the time to read the other articles and take, keep in touch with what's really happening with their children. Why, I think that's a marvelous idea, the coach said, brightening. Hey, high pockets, Tommy jeered on his way out the door, trying to sweet talk your way out of gym class again. Marvin stiffened and shot an icy stare at Meat and Tommy. I don't know what you're talking about, Turner. Coach Goodenough looked at them too, furring his brow. You two are fine ones to talk. I suppose you thought I didn't see you carrying on during my lecture. Sorry, Coach, Meat said. Uh, we were discussing the game with Green Acre City, Tommy lied. There will be plenty of time to discuss that during practice, boys, Coach Goodenough scolded. Just see that it doesn't happen again. The coach turned his attention back to Marvin, and Tommy and Meat left the room and made their way to the cafeteria for lunch. After going through the usual long lines, they brought their trays over to the table saved by Pee-wee and Tim Cavanaugh. Hey, Tommy, Pee-wee said, with his cheeks full of half-chewed bologna sandwich. I just remembered what day this is. You got the new hit parade? I sure do, Tommy said, as he took his seat and pulled a sheet of paper out of his shirt pocket. Hot off the press. All right, Pee-wee said excitedly. Who's tops? Not Wendy, I hope. It better not be Wendy, or I'm going to have to put in a formal protest. Just hold on to your pecker and wait, Tommy told him impatiently. You know how this works. Juvenile crap, Tim grumbled, picking up his tray. Excuse me, but I don't need it. Suit yourself, Pee-wee said. After Tim had taken his tray to the other side of the cafeteria, he added, That guy, such a hard ass. Tommy rattled his sheet and cleared his throat. If you don't mind, short stub. Go, go ahead, Tommy, Pee-wee said, picking up an orange and peeling it as he listened expectantly. A few other guys moseyed over as well, knowing what was coming up. Okay, Tommy lowered his voice an octave so he sounded a little like a disc jockey. Number 10 this month, up from nowhere the month before, Kimberly Austin. All right, Pee-wee shouted. Great, yeah, I put her right up there. Hey, I'm doing this okay, Tommy said, slightly riled. Right, sorry. Pee-wee apologized. Tommy went on. Good. Now then, in the more crucial categories, here's how Kimberly rated. Personality, B. Wit, A. Dancing, B minus. Breasts, A plus. Access, A minus. That's easy for you to say, Frank Bell complained. Frank wanted to be a nuclear physicist when he grew up, and he looked the part. He was homely and anemic. I can't get to first base with her. I'd give her an F for access. Then make your own damn survey, Frank, Tommy said gratingly. How'd she do on shoes? Meat wanted to know. All right, all right, Tommy said, standing up and waving his arms. Look, if you guys don't want to take this seriously, that's fine with me. I mean, I thought I was doing this for our mutual benefit, but if you... It'll be okay, Pee-wee promised. We'll shut up. Just keep going. I'm listening, man, really. Fire away, Meat said. All ears, Frank Bell put in. Tommy waited a minute, then resumed. Number nine, down two notches from last month, Beth Ann Robards. On the major categories, she took straight A's, except for breasts, where she gets a B, and access, which as, Tommy, look out! Pee-wee's warning came too late. Mindy rushed up behind Tommy, and before he could pull his hand away, she snatched up his list and dashed off. Hey, Tommy howled. Damn you. In her haste, Mindy ran into another girl carrying a full tray of food to her table. Chocolate milk and potato chips flew into the air like shrapnel, adding to the confusion and creating enough chaos to prevent Tommy from catching up to Mindy before she reached Wendy's group of girlfriends. Aha! Wendy shouted triumphantly as she took the sheet from Mindy and rushed from the cafeteria yards ahead of her pursuers. Behind Tommy, 
Pee-wee was wriggling his way through the throng of students who had taken advantage of the commotion to raise a ruckus of their own. As Tommy and Pee-wee bounded out of the cafeteria, the door to the faculty lounge burst open and Coach Goodenough and Principal Carter waded into the fray to try to restore order. Wendy ran outside and across the field where several gym classes were in session, putting a game of Chinese volleyball between her and the boys. Gasping for breath, she uncrumpled the sheet of paper in her hand and quickly looked it over. A smile slowly spread across her face. Hey, Wendy, come on, give us a break, Tommy said, as he and Pee-wee caught up with her. You don't want to be looking at that. Number three, Wendy said, looking up from the list. I'm flattered, Tommy. What? Pee-wee exclaimed. Tommy, how could you? You moved her up three spots from last month. What for? A plus for access, Wendy read. Sheesh, Tommy, that's what I get for going out with Pee-wee. Hey, no fair, Pee-wee griped. That's a cheap shot. Tommy took a step closer to Wendy and held his hand out. Let me have it, Wendy, please. I ought to really let you have it, you jerk, Wendy threatened. I ought to let all the girls have a look at this. Then we'll see what kind of action you get. Wendy, it's just a gag, Tommy pleaded. Gag is right, Wendy said, looking at the names on the slip of paper. I know a lot of girls who gag over this. Just let me have the list, okay? Tommy said. Pee-wee crouched and told Tommy, if you want, I'll tackle her and then you can get it easy. You come close to me and you won't have anything left to put a rubber on, Pee-wee, Wendy warned, making a squeezing motion with her fingers. Pee-wee stayed put. Wendy looked at both boys as she reached to her blouse and undid the top button. That gave her enough space to reach in and tuck the list inside her bra. She smiled coyly at Tommy. My access rating's just gone down to an F, as far as you're concerned. Wendy, you know that thing you were going to get for me, she said. Yeah, Tommy said, glancing over at Pee-wee. Free, Wendy said. I want it for free. Come on, Wendy, that thing costs at least ten bucks. Free. Wendy insisted. What's she talking about? Pee-wee wanted to know. What thing cost ten bucks? Never mind, Pee-wee. Tommy stared at Wendy a moment longer, then slowly nodded his head. Okay, Wendy, you got it. Good, she said. As soon as you give it to me, I'll give you your list back. Blackmailer, Tommy accused. Have a good day, Wendy said with a smile. Then she added, Boys, you'll get yours, Pee-wee warned her. Just wait. I will, Pee-wee, she laughed. I will. Pee-wee and Tommy watched her head back to the cafeteria. Tommy, what thing are you getting for her that costs ten bucks, huh? Pee-wee asked. Forget about it, would you, Pee-wee? A dildo? Pee-wee guessed. You're going to get her a dildo, right? Tommy rolled his eyes. You're the one who needs the dildo, Pee-wee. Come on, let's get back and eat. On their way back to the cafeteria, Mickey and Billy joined them. Hey, what was the big stink with Wendy? Billy asked. She got hold of Tommy's top ten, Pee-wee said. She's holding it ransom for a dildo. Right, Tommy? Pee-wee doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, Tommy muttered. I talked to Brian Schwartz, Billy said, changing the subject. He'll let us know later if he wants to go tonight. Great, Tommy said. Hey, not too many guys, Pee-wee said. You know what they say, too many dicks spoil the pussy. Who says that, Pee-wee? Billy asked sarcastically. Hell, I don't know, Pee-wee admitted. Somebody should, though. Halfway across the field, the boys suddenly stopped, almost coming to attention. Walking toward them were the two girls' gym instructors. Miss Honeywell was in her early twenties, and even though she was totally unavailable as far as any of the students were concerned, she'd rated first on Tommy Turner's top ten every month since she joined the Angel Beach staff two years ago. 
She had long brown hair and always wore a skimpy yellow gym skirt that showed her fabulous legs to their best advantage. Even meat would have given them an A. Miss Ballbricker, however, was another matter. Fifty-five years old and built like an all-pro linebacker, she was a scowling menace filled with bile and brimstone. It was her withering gaze that had stopped the boys from crossing her path. As she neared them, she leered with particular contempt at Tommy, who was busy trying to keep his eyes inside his head when they wanted to crawl up Miss Honeywell's legs and bury themselves under the folds of her skirt. Miss Ballbricker stopped in front of the boys and stood silently until she had Tommy's attention. The two of them had a rivalry going back to Tommy's sophomore year when he'd first earned her wrath by having her name embroidered on a jock strap that somehow found itself run up the flagpole during graduation ceremonies. Getting yourself into trouble, Mr. Turner? Miss Ballbricker said. Oh, no, ma'am, Tommy said. Of course not. A likely story. Miss Ballbricker turned and stalked off to catch up with Miss Honeywell. Tommy called out to her. My, but you look nice this morning, Miss Ballbricker. His voice was dripping with sarcasm. Are you losing weight? Miss Ballbricker stopped in place and slowly looked back over her shoulder. Tommy smiled politely at her. Her face was red with rage, but she was too flustered to retort. Miss Honeywell was waiting for her at the door leading to the women's locker room, and she finally turned and walked off. When both women had disappeared inside, Mickey looked at Tommy and said, Phew, you like to live dangerously, Turner. She wants a piece of your ass, man, Billy added. Bulldike bitch, Tommy spat as they started back to the cafeteria. Come on, Turner, Mickey joked. We all know you've been waiting all your life for a chance to slip it to Miss Ballbricker. Hey, give me a break, Tommy snapped. I just ate. You ranked her number two, didn't you? Billy joined in. Buzz off, both you guys, Tommy said. Who was number two? Pee-wee asked. Your mother, Pee-wee. Chapter Four The Original Student Underground Coach Goodenough had two underlings to help him run the boys' physical education program. Roy Brackett, who was in charge of the freshman basketball team and the intramural sports program, wasn't much more than a kid himself. He was a recent graduate from Sarasota City College, lean, boyish-faced, and proud owner of the state basketball high school record for consecutive free throws. His apartment bathroom was wallpapered with news clippings that testified to his accomplishment. Here at Angel Beach, he was putting in time to earn his teaching credential, and Coach Goodenough had put him under the supervision of assistant coach Fred Warren. Warren had been a fixture at Angel Beach High for the past 15 years, discounting his stint in the war, and he had yet to reach his 40th birthday. He was short but muscular, and a grin was always on his face, as if he were constantly pulling fast ones on the world around him. Today, the target of Coach Warren's humor was none other than his young protege. It was the last period gym class. Warren was keeping an eye on the boys who were on the basketball court, taking idle shots while they waited for the bell to ring, and Roy had his eyes on the other side of the gym, where Miss Honeywell was leading the cheerleaders through pom-pom routines. Miss Honeywell was aware of her audience, and whenever she twisted to one side and shook her pom-poms, she let her gaze sweep Roy's way long enough for them to make eye contact. Miss Honeywell had lush, round lips, and she had a way of moving them that pressed Roy's jockstrap into work overtime. Mmm, Roy moaned softly, nudging Warren until the older coach turned for a look at Miss Honeywell. Boy, would I like to get next to that. Ah, yes, lassie, Coach Warren smirked knowingly. He put a hand on Roy's shoulder and confided, Patience, my boy, patience. What? Roy said. Lassie. Why do you call her Lassie? Why do you think? I don't know. Warren laughed lightly. 
He looked around to make sure no one was watching. Then he turned his chin up and let out a soft howl like the bane of a hound. The bell rang and the boys charged off the floor, shouting their way into their locker room. The girls remained in the gym, however. So did coaches Brackett and Warren. Roy took another look at Miss Honeywell, then told Warren, Are you crazy? You call her a dog? That's angel food cake, I'm telling you. You touch her and the Food and Drug Administration will get you for fucking dessert. What can I tell you? Warren said as he started gathering up the basketballs. You can tell me why you call her Lassie, Roy persisted as he helped Warren. Coach Warren took aim with one of the balls and heaved it neatly through the hoop. Just get her up in the equipment room and you'll find out, he said, walking off to retrieve the ball. Roy followed alongside him intrigued. What are you talking about? Nothing, Coach Warren grinned. Forget I said anything. Fat chance, Roy moaned. No, that's Miss Ballbreaker, Warren laughed. Up in the boys' locker room, Pee-wee was standing on top of the shelves in the equipment cage, peering through slats in the wall that provided him with a view past the upper bleachers to the gym floor below. The others were watching him expectantly while they sat in front of their lockers, wiping sweat from their armpits with wet towels and going heavy on the deodorant so they could skip their showers. Other priorities were beckoning. As of today, the top secret Beaver Underground was fully operational for the first time all semester. Well, Billy called out. Pee-wee stood on his tiptoes and pressed his face closer to the slats. The girls' tumbling team's gone in. Those broads never shower, Tommy complained. What about the cheerleaders? They're still there, Pee-wee said glumly. Keep checking, Billy called out to him. Billy, Tim Cavanaugh, Tommy, and Meat were waiting together in front of one set of lockers. On the other side of the room, Brian Schwartz, a senior transfer student from Miami Beach, had already dressed. He had the look of an unwilling loner about him as he glanced hesitantly at the others. So I guess I'll meet you guys at eight, he said. Right, Tommy said, the deadbeat parking lot. Brian nodded and left the locker room. The moment the door closed behind him, Tim stood up and flung a tennis shoe angrily through the air. It slammed loudly into Brian's locker, startling the others. Hey, what gives, Kavanaugh? Tim paced before his locker, tensed up, fists clenched. Tightly as he fought back an inner rage that was consuming him. Finally, he whirled around and slammed his locker door shut with such ferocity that it bounded back open and rattled on its hinges. It's bad enough we're screwing a bra that lives with a nigger without inviting a Jew along, he complained bitterly as he buttoned his shirt. All we need is a communist and a spick, and we got it all. The others glanced at one another warily. They'd heard Kavanaugh blow up like this countless times before at the slightest provocation. Billy wasn't in the mood for it. As he tied his shoes, he told Tim sarcastically, You sure are the tolerant type, aren't you, Kavanaugh? I notice you're still including yourself in tonight. Pussy is pussy, man, Tim said. I just don't know why we gotta invite some friggin' kike. Meat and Tommy shook their heads as they finished dressing. Billy told Tim, Brian's a good guy. He's only been here a week. Give him a chance. He's a prick, Tim said angrily, and a Jewish prick at that. It's going to be crowded enough tonight as it is. What the fuck did you have to let him in on it for? All right, Tim, you've made your point, Billy said. We won't have him come this time. But you're an asshole, you know that? Tim came over and glared into Billy's face. Maybe you want to step outside and call me that ace. And maybe I don't, Kavanaugh, Billy said firmly. Look, you got something against taking it easy now and then? I mean, doesn't that chip ever get a little heavy, toning it around on your shoulder all the time? Tim was about to make a move for Billy when Meat reached out and pulled him away. Okay, Tim, Meat said with calm force. Party's over. Tim shook Meat's hands off his shoulders, snarling. I thought at least you'd be on my side. 
I am, Meat replied, when you aren't being a jerk. Tim grabbed his tennis shoe and put it in his locker, then took his books and glowered at the others a last time before storming off, just as Pee-wee was jumping down from the shelves in the equipment cage, bristling with excitement. They're going in, he shouted. Come on, let's hurry. Miss Honeywell's with them. Slow down, Tommy said, holding Pee-wee back. We gotta do this right. Don't blow it. Stealing from the locker room, the boys clung to the shadows until they reached a side door near the concession stand. The door opened to a set of steps that was surrounded on either side by thick bushes. Pee-wee checked to make sure there was no one nearby then dropped behind the bushes and squirmed through a narrow window leading to a crawl space that ran beneath the gymnasium. There were conduits, pipes, and dust-covered boxes strewn about in the shadowy darkness, but the boys knew their way and wriggled purposefully through the maze until they reached a cinder block dividing wall they had managed to partially dismantle over the course of the semester. On the other side of the wall, there was room to stand, and they proceeded cautiously past another series of pipes until they at last came to a grotto-like alcove lit by light coming in through another narrow window in the building's foundation. One-inch piping covered the far wall of the space like man-made ivy. Tommy and Billy bent down and carefully took hold of one length of the pipe that ran parallel to the ground. Twisting their wrists slowly, they swiveled the pipe upward. Three elbow joints swung clear of the wall, exposing custom-made peepholes. The boys promptly took their positions. Through the holes, they had a knee-high view of the girls' shower room. Oh no, Pee-wee whispered as he peered in. He only caught a brief glimpse of a woman stepping out of the showers before she was gone from view. Damn it, I told you we were going to miss them. They kept up their vigil a few seconds later, then pulled away from the peepholes at the sight of Miss Ballbricker approaching the showers, still dressed in her uniform. The boys held their breath and tried not to move. They could hear the soles of her tennis shoes squeaking on the wet tiles as she paced and hummed suspiciously to herself. After what seemed like an eternity, her footsteps retreated and the boys heard the snap of a light switch as Miss Ballbricker left the showers. Pee-wee hurriedly put his eye to the peephole, but there was nothing to see now but darkness. He slumped down to the ground, heartbroken. Oh man, so close. Hang on, Pee-wee, Tommy assured him. We'll get him next time. Yeah, Pee-wee admitted bleakly, but that was Miss Honeywell we almost got to see. A real woman, and we missed her. Billy grinned at Tommy, then told Pee-wee, Quit your complaining. After all, you're going to get laid by an exotic dancer in a couple hours. Now that's a real woman for you. That was all Pee-wee had to hear. His spirits surged as they made their way back through the underground crawl space. Yeah, right, he said, bubbling with newfound enthusiasm. Yeah, hurry up, you guys. I gotta go home and warm up. As they climbed up out the window and made their way back into their own locker room, Billy and Neat exchanged glances. Warm up? Neat wondered aloud. Chapter 5 The Strange Ecstasies of Cherry Forever A full moon probed through the mangroves, stirring up nightlife in the swamp. Crickets chafed their legs together and chirped loudly for mates in the dank undergrowth, while birds sent out their sporadic calls from the treetops. Bullfrogs belched from the banks of dark marshes, their tongues rolled and ready to stab at any of the buzzing insects that might whiz within striking distance. Twelve-foot-long gators rested their swollen bellies in the long grass as their small red eyes peered out into the darkness and their widened jaws emitted the rank smell of their last meal. Mickey guided his pickup down the road and a 
across a bridge that spanned one arm of the marshes. He peered intently through the windshield as his headlights probed the ghost-like fog that rose from the ground. Billy and Tommy were riding shotgun. In the back, Meat, Tim, Pee-wee, and Frank Bell were sitting in the truck bed, contemplating the pleasures awaiting them. Slow down, Tommy told Mickey as he stared out the side window, looking for landmarks. It's about a quarter of a mile from here, on the left side. You sure that broad could find this place? Mickey wondered skeptically. They're both there already, Tommy said. I took Conklin myself, and I drew Cherry a map. She'll be there, no sweat. Cherry, Billy said. Yeah, Tommy said. Cherry Forever, that's her professional name. Cherry forever, Mickey muttered. Are you shitting me? Hey, you've been to those strip joints. They all use names like that. You know it, Tommy said. Cherry forever, Mickey repeated, grinning. How'd you get her to go along with all this anyway? I knew her language, Tommy boasted. Yeah, what's that? Twenty dollars? You got it. Mickey let out a whoop and banged his fist on the steering wheel. Beautiful. Just fucking beautiful. I can't wait, man. I can't wait. Yeah, well, just be cool, Billy advised, checking through the rear window to see if the others were listening. Don't be blowing it now that we've got him this far. Tim Kavanaugh got up into his knees and back and leaned over the side of the truck, calling up to Mickey. Hey, why the hell would she live way out here anyway? Christ, we're in the middle of the goddamn Everglades. Mickey turned his head and shouted back. If you were shacking up with a colored dude and screwing everybody in sight, where would you live? Peavy was riding next to Tim in back, and he shivered with expectation. Hot damn, step on it! On they went, farther into uninhabited wilderness. A few hundred yards down the road, Mickey killed the engine, snapped off the headlights, and let the truck drift off the shoulder to a stop across the road from a small, dark shack that was set back in the midst of rampant overgrowth. Mickey opened his door, and everyone quietly piled out and huddled close together near the front fender, keeping the truck between them and the shack. That's the place? Pee-wee whispered uncertainly. Shh, Billy said, holding his hand up to quiet Pee-wee. Meat leaned over and mumbled in Pee-wee's ear. What'd you expect, the Hilton? Watching the darkened windows of the shack, Tommy cupped his hands together in front of his face and blew through his thumbs, giving off a poor imitation of a night owl. One long hoot, two short. What is this shit? Tim wondered skeptically. Just then, the lights came on inside the shack. Okay, Tommy said standing up and starting across the road. The coast is clear. Let's go. As the others bolted from cover, Tim grumbled to himself. The coast is clear. Do you believe this dialogue? The shack looked even more run down up close than it did from a distance. The walk was overrun with weeds, and the wooden steps leading up to the front door were half rotted away. It was a small miracle that the entire entourage following Tommy's lead made it inside without injury. There was a steady current of giddy laughter and mating calls as they fought each other to get through the narrow hallway leading to the living room. If anyone had lived in this room during the past few years, they'd taken care to remove the evidence. There was no furniture except for a mildewed mattress, a broken refrigerator, and a splintered orange crate. Three different layers of wallpaper were flaking from the walls, and spiderwebs stretched out across most of the ceiling and wound downward from the dust-layered light fixture that gave the room its stark illumination. If there was anything remotely new in the room besides the light bulb, it was the few scattered beer cans that lay crumpled on the mud-tracked rug. Somebody lives in this dump? Frank Bell asked. You've got to be kidding. This can't be for real. 
They live in the back rooms, Tommy explained. All this is just to keep away the tourists. My ass, Tim said. That's what Cherry's going to want to take a bite out of when she sees you, Kavanaugh, Billy teased. I don't even think we're going to see this fucking Cherry you keep talking about, Tim retorted. Hey, look, man, Meat said. If you don't want any, then go wait in the truck. Yeah, Kavanaugh. Peewee cupped his hand in front of his groin and made a stroking gesture. I'll take your turn, and you can make it with Rosie Palm. Tommy and Billy went to the door leading to the back room. The others could see a shaft of light reaching out from under the door. Wait here, Tommy told the others. What's going on? Meat asked after Tommy and Billy had gone off into the other room and closed the door behind them. This stinks, Tim complained. No, man, Pee-wee said. Everything's cool. They're just first, that's all. I got sloppy seconds. Bullshit, Meat said. I'm second. Hell no, Pee-wee complained. If you go first, she'll be so reamed out nobody else will be able to touch the sides. Pee-wee's got a point, Frank Bell said. He sure does, Meat grinned. About the size of a thumbtack, too. Right, Pee-wee? No dick jokes, Pee-wee said. Tommy and Billy stepped back out into the living room. They looked all business. Okay, Cherry's ready, Tommy announced. Everybody take your clothes off. What? Meat exclaimed. No way, Tim said. What are you guys trying to pull? Yeah, what gives? Frank Bell demanded. Mickey protested too, but only half-heartedly. She wants to make sure everybody's clean, Billy said. No VD. How's she going to tell that by looking at us? Frank wanted to know. Tommy said, she's done this so many times she's practically a doctor. Yeah, Tim snapped, still not convinced. Who's going to inspect her? Billy put his hands on his hips and said, look, did you guys come here to get laid or have a debate? Okay, I'm ready, Pee-wee chimed. His pants were already down around his ankles and he was yanking off his shirt. Come on, you guys, don't keep the lady waiting. The ice was broken, so Mickey, Meat, Frank, and Tim all quickly climbed out of their clothes and set them aside in neat piles on top of their shoes. Tim looked at Tommy and Billy and asked, Hey, how come you guys still got your clothes on? Billy told Tim solemnly, We were inspected last week. As the five newcomers lined up in the middle of the room for inspection, Tommy threw the bedroom door open and called in, Okay, Cherry. All eyes turned to the doorway. Pee-wee started thinking about garbage and piles of horse manure. Somebody told him that way he'd stay harder longer. The last thing he wanted to do was jump the gun before he'd had his chance to be alone with Cherry forever. First, they heard the sound of spiked heels on the floorboards, and then Cherry walked into view. She was an apparition straight out of Fredericks of Hollywood. Her red satin vest with black fringe only partially covered her sumptuous, swaying breasts. Around her waist, she wore a taut G-string with heart-shaped valentines covering what the boys had come for. Her arms and legs were sheathed in fishnet stockings, and her face was made up with enough cosmetics to open a beauty parlor. She paused in the doorway and swayed with sensual exaggeration as she peered through lowered eyelashes at the boys lined up before her. They were all silent and wide-eyed. Tommy, finally, took a step forward and gestured for Cherry to begin her inspection of the troops. Hips rocking back and forth, she sashayed up to the first boy in line. Tommy said, Cherry, this is Tim. Hi, Tim, Cherry said casually, spreading her moist lips into a warm, lascivious smile. Uh, hi, Tim said uncertainly. The anger was gone from him, and he seemed almost frightened now. Cherry reached out and pressed her fingers slightly against Tim's testicles, requesting, Now turn your head and cough. The silence of the others was broken by a burst of nervous laughter. Cherry winked at Tim and moved on. And this is Pee-wee, Tommy said. I'll say, Cherry snickered. 
glancing down. Hey, Pee Wee said. Face to face with Cherry, it was hard for him to think of garbage. It was hard for him to stand still. What do you wear for a jock strap, kid? Cherry quipped. A peanut shell and a rubber band? Everyone had another laugh at Pee Wee's expense. Bastards, he grumbled. Cherry looked at Tommy and said, We'll have to tie a board across his ass or he's liable to fall in. Pee Wee's face turned red with embarrassment, but at least he could stop worrying about garbage and horse manure for a while. He'd gone limp as wilting celery. Cherry, meet Frank Bell, Tommy said, continuing introductions. Cherry surveyed Frank with a furrowed brow. It's crooked, Frank. You've been screwing around corners? There was more laughter as Cherry moved on and made her acquaintance with Mickey. I got some nice Dixie Dick for you, ma'am, Mickey said with mock politeness. Well, now, that's real nice of you, Mickey, Cherry said in an exaggerated southern accent. That would make me the belle of the ball, wouldn't it? You bet, ma'am. And last, but far from least, Tommy said as they came to the end of the line. This is the pride of Angel Beach High, known affectionately as Meat. Cherry's eyes widened as she observed Meat's claim to fame. Good God, the boy's deformed. Meat grinned, pleased. Billy confided to Cherry, you'll need a shoehorn with him. That or a crowbar, Cherry said. Looking back up at Meat, she went on, you stay here at the end of the line. The best for last, Meat said. Cherry tapped her temple with a painted fingernail. Smart boy, you'll go places. Strolling back toward the bedroom, she made a sweeping gesture with her arm, shouting out like a wagon train master. All right, let's head him up and move him out. Billy followed her inside, and Tommy paused in the doorway, telling the others, Don't worry, men, there's plenty for everyone. Well, get down to it, Pee-wee hollered. She's hot. She won't be making cracks at me when I'm through with her. When he stepped into the bedroom and closed the door, Tommy had to put his hand over his mouth to keep from laughing out loud. Cherry forever slumped into a battered black recliner, draped one leg over the armrest, and took a long draw from a bottle of Jack Daniels. Billy got up from the dilapidated bed and quietly slipped open the rear window. He leaned out and gave a hand to Conklin, the lumbering black giant who'd been waiting for them behind the house. He had a stocking cap pulled tight around his head and light glinted off the gold caps in his front teeth when he laughed lowly at his co-conspirators. Tommy put a finger to his lips to make everyone keep quiet. In the other room, they heard the boys in the waiting line murmuring back and forth. Pee-wee was coming up with alliterations for everyone's position in line. I'm sloppy seconds. Tim, you're throbbing thirds. Frank is fishy fifths. And meat, you're six sixths. Cherry looked up from the chair at Tommy. You guys stopped by the nursery to pick that one up on the way? Shh, Billy said, moving over and sitting on the broken bed. Its springs groaned under his weight. Okay. Now, Tommy signaled Cherry. Cherry took another swallow from her bottle, then closed her eyes and eased back in the chair. She looked bored out of her mind, but sounded like she was taking a bath in Spanish flies. As Billy started bouncing up and down on the bed, she moaned with ecstasy. Oh, Billy, you big stud. Oh, give it to me. Billy, fuck me, you animal. I need it. More, more, harder, harder. Oh, God, I can't wait for the next one. In the living room, Pee-wee crossed his legs and tried to keep his teeth from chattering. Hey, man, we're going to get laid, he cried. This broad really wants it. She's hot. She's really hot. The others in the room were getting equally excited, although Mickey's exclamations were more attempts at hiding his laughter. Damnation, boys, she's one certified buy you bitch in heat. Shit, I just hope it don't fall off before I get to her. Through the door, they heard the continued moanings of Cherry forever. Oh, Billy, 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 you're driving me crazy. 
Keep humping me, you stud, you stud. I'm getting there. Oh, yeah, baby, I'm going to come. I'm going to come. Oh, yes, Daddy, make it happen. Conklin took over the chore of bouncing up and down on the bed while Billy took out a plastic bottle of theatrical blood he'd swiped from drama class back at school and started smearing it over Tommy's chest and face. All the while, Cherry forever sat back in the recliner, yawning between her declarations of unleashed passion. Oh, Billy, you're so good. I can't stand it. More, more. Suck my titties. Bite em harder, harder. Oh, yeah, squeeze em just as hard now. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, I'm getting there. Oh, now, baby, don't stop now. Billy went back over to the bed and started jumping up and down on it so hard the legs thumped on the hardwood floor. Conklin, in the meantime, went over to the window where Tommy handed him a three-foot-long machete. The big man was almost choking as he tried to keep his teary-eyed laughter to himself. He held out the machete and Billy poured blood over the blade. Out in the other room, Pee-wee was staring anxiously at the ceiling, thinking as hard as he could about whole dumps of garbage and huge silos filled with horse manure. His loins felt like they were churning inside a blender. Everybody else was staring at the door, filled with their own bulging anticipation. Oh, my baby, Cherry was howling, now! Her frenzied wailing was suddenly cut short by the sound of a window being smashed in. Pee-wee reflexively jumped back, almost bowling meat over in his fear. What the hell? Tim gasped, his jaw dropping. There were more sounds of thrashing in the other room than a loud, booming voice that none of the boys recognized. What's going on here, you candy-ass motherfuckers? I'll kill you white boys. No white boys messes with my woman. Pee-wee grabbed Meat's arm like a frightened child. Mickey was doubling over with his hand clamped over his mouth to hold back his laughter. Frank shrank back, terrified. Tim clasped his hands over his privates as he looked around the room for something to defend himself with. A series of screams and howls came from the bedroom, punctuated by the dull, fierce thuds of a blunt instrument making contact. No, don't kill me, Tommy shrieked with terror. Please spare me, mister. No, don't kill me. He's the one. I was just watching. Honest, I swear. You're both dead meat. Inside the bedroom, Cherry Forever was holding her sides, and her mascara was running from tears of laughter, while Conklin was close to choking on his guffaws. Billy held up a chair for him to beat on with the flat edge of the machete. Don't kill us, mister, Billy pleaded hoarsely. We're only just boys. Cherry brought herself under control enough to implore, Don't hurt them, Hector. Aren't two dead men enough for you? At the words, two dead men, Pee-wee let out a pathetic whimper and looked up at me. We're all gonna die. The bedroom door opened and a blood-covered Tommy staggered out, staring vacantly around the room as if he couldn't see the reaction of the naked fivesome watching him. He bobbed his lower lip, trying to speak, then sagged to his knees and fell face first onto the carpet. Tommy! Frank Bell gasped numbly, backing away from the would-be corpse. Behind him, Meat was pulling Pee-wee along with him as he started for the hallway. Even Tim was beginning to show signs of fear. Nobody was paying attention to Mickey, who was now on the floor on the other side of the room, convulsing in fits of laughter. Tommy had somehow managed to close the bedroom door behind him, and with a sudden rupturing explosion, the door splintered outward under the sheer weight of the black man's charging form. Wielding the machete, he swayed drunkenly to avoid stepping on Tommy, then turned his flashing eyes on the naked boys before him. He was in hysterics, but it passed for rage. I'll kill you all, he roared. I'll kill you, you white little pecker woods. He raised the knife over his head and took a vicious swipe through the air. Meat and Pee-wee turned their backs on him and sped down the hallway to the steps, leaped to the ground, and scrambled quickly to their feet. Frank, Mickey, and Tim soon caught up with them. 
the five boys, naked to the world, looked back at the house and saw the silhouetted form of the machete-swinging maniac coming after them. Mickey and Meat bolted toward the pickup, with Mickey screaming, I don't have my keys! I don't have my keys! Run for it, Meat! Don't let him catch us! As, as Meat reached the roadway, he broke into a full sprint and rushed away from the direction by which they'd come to the shack. Mickey only ran as far as his truck, then collapsed over the front hood and laughed until his sides ached. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Pee-wee hit the road, running back toward town and pumping his arms furiously. His bare ass bobbed like a deer tail in the moonlight. Don't look back, Pee-wee was gasping as he ran. Don't look back, cause I'll be right behind and you're dead. The blood was pulsing too fiercely against his temples for him to hear that he was running by himself. On and on he ran, with his eyes on the road before him. Sheer terror put him in a near trance, and the only thought he could hold on to was to run and keep running. When he saw a pair of approaching headlights, he veered out of the car's path and continued to run. Moments later, the car turned around and started to follow him. As it slowly gained on him, Pee-wee noticed the flicker of rotating police lights out of the corner of his eye. He looked to his side and saw Mickey's older brother, Sheriff Ted Jarvis, in the passenger seat, eyeing him with a curious smile. Okay, buddy, Ted said with mock gravity. Pull over. It took Pee-wee a good dozen yards to bring himself to a stop, and as he leaned over, gasping for breath and trying to cover himself, Ted asked him nonchalantly, You got any identification? Chapter 6 Rendezvous at the Deadbeat Diner Homing pigeons and spawning salmon have nothing over high schoolers. Drop any high schooler off at the outskirts of an unknown town at sunset, and by the end of the night you'll be able to find him or her somewhere on the street with the highest concentration of fast food joints hanging out with their peers. Drop them off in Angel Beach, and they'd find their way to the Deadbeat Diner on Bartlett Avenue. It was within earshot of the beach and safely removed from the suburbs where people like to sleep at night. Deadbeat food was cheap and filling, and if you didn't mind french fries cooked in the same grease as the onion rings, or burgers served on buns that were drier than the boxes they came in, you could pad your stomach nicely before going out into the parking lot to drink beer and run off at the mouth with your buddies. Tonight, the Cherry Forever Saga was being inducted into the Angel Beach Folklore Hall of Fame. The incident had been history for less than two hours, and already it was into its dozen three telling, assuming the stature of legend with each embellishment. Most of episode's participants were gathered in the parking lot of the deadbeat, reliving those fun-filled moments for the benefit of fellow classmates. Mickey had the group's attention. He was sitting on the front fender of his pickup with a manic gleam in his eye as he spoke. So, anyhow, I saw that old meat here was still hightailing it down the road, and I figured we could get a few more laughs out of him. I called over the big nig, the big color guy, and told him my plan. Then I took off running to catch up with me, just screaming at the top of my lungs that the big guy was hot on our trail. Well, that was all that Meat had to hear. He ducked off the road and started thrashing into the swamps. Shit, he was so damn scared that if he'd run into an alligator, he'd have climbed down the sucker's throat like Jonah crawling into the belly of a well, just to make sure he got himself properly hit. There were laughs all around, and Wendy elbowed Meat who was going along with the ribbing as he drained off a can of beer. Wiping foam from his lips, he called out to Mickey. You got it all wrong, Jarvis. I just set a record for the hundred-yard dash going down the road, and I went off to soak my feet so they wouldn't blister. Get your facts straight. Tommy and Billy both booed, holding out their fists and giving Meat's comeback a thumbs down. Some of the others joined in, and Meat flipped them all the finger, still grinning. Hey, I ain't got to the good part yet, Mickey said, jumping down from his truck. It keeps getting better. 
By the time I reached the spot where Meat had split from the road, he was already knee-deep in the swamps, bogged down like he was trying to run through molasses. I waited for the Negro to catch up with me, then we ducked down into a ditch where Meat couldn't see us. The guy started beating on one of the trees, shouting something like, Take that, white boy! Here's one for my missus! I screamed bloody murder and called out for Meat to come save me before I got myself beat to a pulp. Then both me and the Negro shut up a sec to see what old Meat was going to do. We heard him still slapping his way through the marshes, but he wasn't coming back. Hell no, he was ready to leave me, his best damn buddy, to get my ass turned into taffy. Meat, Wendy gasped with feigned shock. How could you do something like that? Easy, Meat said. I had the big game fried to think about. Hell, Mickey's only second string, right? He was expendable. Hey, hey, Billy shouted, licking his index finger and chalking up one for Meat. Yeah, well, kiss my Dixie ass, Mickey laughed, then continued. Anyway, after a few seconds, it got real quiet in the swamps. We couldn't hear Meat anymore, and I started to get worried, thinking maybe he'd got himself picked off by a gator after all. I waited for the rest of the guys to catch up with us. Frank and Tim had put their clothes on already, and they'd brought mine along. I hurried up and got dressed while everybody else called out to tell Meat everything was all right. He didn't answer, so we decided to spread out and start looking for him. Well, as soon as we took a few steps, we all of a sudden heard this weird sound, like a sick moose or something. Meat started laughing to himself. Tommy told him, hey, come on, Meat, don't spoil it. Meat brought himself under control while Mickey went on. We kept hearing the sound, and nobody could figure out what the hell it was. Just to be safe, though, we started looking for logs and rocks we could pick up to protect ourselves with. We fanned out and circled around the noise, then closed in real quiet-like. Still no sign of poor old Meat. I was starting to figure maybe the sound was a gator with indigestion from eating too much, if you know what I mean. Finally, we all came up on this dinky little pond, maybe a foot and a half deep. That's where the sound was coming from, and what do you think we saw? Mickey paused and looked at his audience. Those who had been with him back in the swamps were buckling over in laughter, and even those who didn't know what was coming were starting to snicker in anticipation. Meat, Wendy guessed. Mickey nodded, grinning wide. You got it. There he was, lying on his back in a foot and a half of water, breathing through this hunk of hollow reed, which was making all the noise. Stupid jerk thought he was hidden from view, and here he was, sounding like he's blowing a damn trumpet. And not only that, but his peckers poking up from the water like a goddamn periscope. As the throng around the pickup broke out in an uproar, Mickey leaned back over the hood of his pickup and cupped his hand over his mouth as he stared up at the night sky and imitated Meat's frantic breathing through the reed. Hey, Jarvis, Meat shouted with mock anger, pointing to his pants. I got something else you can blow on, you redneck jerk. This time, Tommy chalked up a score for Meat and called out, I'd say they're tied by my count. We might have to go into overtime. Before Mickey could come up with a retort, Billy pointed to the police car pulling into the parking lot. Hey, Mickey, it looks like your brother. There was a quick shuffling of hands and feet as the teenagers got rid of their beer cans before the patrol car came to a stop. Ted Jarvis got out of the passenger side. He was 15 years older than his kid brother and more heavily built. Ted had managed to shake off any trace of family lineage in his accent, the same way he joined the sheriff's department in hopes of disassociating himself from his relative's lawless, redneck background. We found something you guys lost out in the Everglades, Ted said as he took a step back and opened the rear door of the car. Pee-wee climbed out, wearing the tan sheriff's shirt belonging to Ted's partner and nothing else. The shirt was half a dozen sizes too large for him, and the tails hid his privates. You bastards, Pee-wee shouted. You left me out there. Hell, Pee-wee, Mickey said. We thought you ran all the way home. Ted chuckled. If we hadn't seen him, he would have. You guys got my clothes? Pee-wee whined. They weren't back at the shack. Nah, Cherry forever kept them for a souvenir, Tommy said. You guys think you're pretty funny, don't you? Pee-wee accused, trying to ignore the chorus of laughter aimed at him. 
Billy reached into the back of Mickey's truck and grabbed Pee-wee's clothes for him. Ted Jarvis said, Go ahead and change, Pee-wee. We'll wait. As Pee-wee scampered off, Ted looked at his younger brother and the other pranksters. Look, guys, I don't want to lecture you or anything, because I did my share of pranks when I was your age, but there's a line to it, and you came really close to crossing it. You're lucky no one got hurt back there. Okay, okay, Mickey said, swaggering up to his brother. No sermons, okay? Admit it, it was pretty damn funny, right? I didn't say it wasn't, Mickey, Ted said patiently. You're missing the point. It was for laughs, man, Mickey said. Christ, you should have seen that big fucking nigger come after us. What'd you call him? Ted asked. Okay, okay, the Negro. That better? Mickey looked back at Tommy and Billy, shaking his head. I swear, it's getting to the point where I'm going to need an interpreter to make sure I talk like a good Yankee boy. Just don't be an asshole, Ted suggested. You don't have to talk like some backwoods redneck to impress the ladies. Mickey walked up to his brother and leaned forward so their faces were only inches apart. Hey, man, he whispered angrily. Why you gotta put me down in front of my friends? You're already down, Ted said coolly. I'm just trying to give you a hand up. When are you going to realize that? Balls, Mickey scowled, stepping back. You just think that shiny badge makes you too good for the rest of us Jarvises. That's your problem. Candy-ass lawman, that's what you are. Ted sighed. He'd been through this all before. Okay, Mickey, suit yourself. Pee-wee came back out of the diner and handed the shirt back to Ted. Ted took it to the car and handed it to his partner, then looked back at his brother. Cindy and I are bringing the kids over for Pa's birthday Wednesday night. I'll see you then. Mickey stuffed his hands in his pockets and kicked a stray stone across the parking lot. Sure, he finally muttered as he rejoined the others. Right. Before Ted got back into the patrol car, a throaty roar cut through the air as a man guided his motorcycle into the parking lot, drinking from a can of beer as he drove. He was a few years older than Ted, in his late thirties, and wore a black leather jacket and close-cropped blonde hair. Straddling the seat behind him was a girl half his age, in tight jeans and a flimsy sweater. Her hair was windblown, and her lower lip jutted out in a look of bored petulance. She didn't even bother to look at the group gathered around Mickey's car. When the driver of the cycle brought his machine to a stop next to the police car, he looked up defiantly at Ted Jarvis and took another sip of beer. Get rid of the beer, Kavanaugh, Ted told the older man calmly. The man grinned sarcastically, then said, Oh, sorry, Officer Jarvis, my mistake. With a flick of his wrist, he tossed the can over his shoulder. It landed with a clatter and spilled suds across the pavement. There was a tense, sudden silence in the parking lot as Ted and the man faced off. In the patrol car, Ted's partner had slipped his shirt back on and was opening the car door when Ted gestured for him to stay put. I could take you in, Kavanaugh, Ted told the man on the motorcycle, but I don't want to smell up the car. Pig talker. Ted ignored the taunt and got back into the patrol car. As his partner drove off, Ted stared a final time at his adversary. One of the girls near Mickey's truck leaned over and asked Billy, Who is that creep? Tim Cavanaugh's old man, Billy told her softly. The girl took another look. Are you sure? He hardly looks old enough. Well, he is, believe me. Kavanaugh remained perched on the motorcycle as he scanned the parking lot for his son. When he spotted him, he shouted, Tim, get your ass over here. Tim was in the midst of the crowd in front of Mickey's truck. He swallowed hard and fidgeted with the sleeves of his own leather jacket. When his father snapped his fingers and waved impatiently for him to come, Tim left the others and shuffled warily over to the motorcycle. Yes, sir, he muttered demurely. Behind him, his friends watched with disbelief. This wasn't the Tim they knew. Mr. Kavanaugh's arm shot out and grabbed Tim by the collar of his jacket as he snapped, He ran tail ass from some nigger tonight. Tim looked down at his feet. 
It was a practical joke, he whispered timidly. His father cocked his head and scowled. What's that, boy? It was a joke, Tim repeated. Mr. Kavanaugh slapped his son across the face with the back of one hand and shoved him away with the other. Joke nothing, he spat contemptuously. You ran chicken shit from a nigger, period. Tim staggered back, rubbing the side of his face as he glared at his father. He kept silent, though. Get your ass home, his father said. We'll go over it some more there. Humiliated, Tim turned and walked over to his car, not daring to look back at the others. He started up the engine and drove off. Mr. Kavanaugh started his bike back up and grinned at the kids watching him. What are you little shit staring at? He didn't wait for an answer. Winking over his shoulder at the girl riding behind him, he revved his engine and rode off, laughing. What an A1 piece of shit, Wendy exclaimed. If I had him for an old man, I'd leave town and change my name. Billy said, I should have left him in prison the last time. Prison? Tommy asked. What was he in for? Come on, don't tell me you never heard, Nicky said. He got sent up for manslaughter, killed a guy in a fight, tore his ear off with his bare hands. Hell, it was in all the papers when it happened. Yeah, I remember that, Tommy said. I just didn't know it was Tim's old man. Not the sort of thing a guy likes to brag about, Billy said. No shit, Tommy muttered. I guess my father's not such a bad guy after all. It was getting late. The crowd started breaking up. Some went back to put in the last order, while others piled into their cars to head home. Most of the Cherry Forever fan club were left to themselves in front of Mickey's truck. They were all quiet, looking up at the moon, except for Pee-wee, who was pacing nervously back and forth with a long face. What are you so glum about, Pee-wee? Billy asked. Catch a coal running all that way bare-assed? As the others sniggered, Pee-wee said, Hey, listen, this is getting serious. I gotta get laid. I go more than a couple weeks, and I start to get jittery. In that case, you're too for a nervous breakdown, Mickey told him. Funny, Jarvis. Billy asked Pee-wee, Well, what do you expect us to do? You missed your big chance with Cherry forever, and you struck out with Wendy. There's nothing left but ham hocks. Nah, Tommy laughed. Pee-wee's tired of ham hocks. Meat said, maybe there's a horny midget out there somewhere, just eating her heart out waiting for Pee-wee. No, Mickey said, as his eyes flashed with sudden inspiration. What we need here is some professional help. What do you mean? Billy wondered. Mickey waited until he had everyone's attention. Then he looked around the parking lot, as if he were afraid to let anyone else listen in on his revelation. He whispered, Porkies. Pee-wee's eyes grew wide. He opened his mouth but was too stunned for words. Oh man, don't start that again, Mickey, Billy complained. Are you crazy? We could all get our throats slit. Mickey grinned smugly, shaking his head. Nah, you just gotta know how to operate. I'm ready, Pee-wee yelped like an excited puppy. I'm ready. Tommy eyed Mickey. You're nuts, Jarvis. Porky is one badass redneck. Exactly, Mickey said proudly, and blood knows blood. You guys just don't know how to talk redneck like I do. Let me handle Porky. Hell, he's just a businessman. I'm ready, I'm ready, Pee-wee said again. Listen, Mickey told the others, he's imported a whole load of Cuban broads that are fantastic beyond belief. I'm ready, I'm telling you. Pee-wee's four inches were straining to get out and prove it. Tommy was still skeptical. How do you know all this, Jarvis? I got my sources, Mickey boasted. They tell me Porky's got a room upstairs at his place called Porky's Pen. You can have a party up there with all the Cuban dancers you can handle if you just let them know you know what you're doing. You sure about this? Billy asked. Hey, doesn't bear shit in the woods? Let's go now, Pee-wee shouted. Right now. Forget it, Pee-wee, Meat said. It's, it's 70 miles from here, for Christ's sake. We need about 30 bucks apiece, Mickey said. 30 bucks, Pee-wee gasped. Yeah, but anything goes, Mickey assured him. He looked at the other guys. We can go Friday night after the game. I don't know, Billy grumbled. What do you say, Tommy? Me? 
Come on, guys. Meat shrugged his shoulders. Peewee was bobbing his head like he had a loose spring in his neck. Tommy finally bared a smile and said, You know my motto, give me pussy or give me death. All right, Mickey exclaimed. Hot damn, Peewee held. I never had any Cuban pussy. Meat smirked and slapped Peewee on the back. Right, Peewee, right. <laughs>